Then a few days ago, there was a shooting in, um, in Atlanta. Now this one is a little bit more complicated because, uh, you know, while the offense, uh, somebody falling asleep at the wheel of his car in a, in a parking lot at Wendy's, intoxicated, then resisting arrest, but then it starts out seemingly pedestrian. But then, uh, during the resisting arrest, he grabs the, the uh, taser of the cop, runs, shoots the taser at the cop, the cop shoots him dead. So while it still seems to me an excess, excess of force, given again the threat that the police faced, it's a little bit more questionable now. And now you have to put yourself, and generally, when it comes to police, put yourself in the shoes of the police. And particularly, the kind of police we see in the streets today. They look like average people, not particularly fit, not particularly striking physically, um, not particularly well-trained. Right? He didn't actually tase the cop. It didn't actually, I don't think it hit the cop. He fired the taser at the cop. Average people, and yet, and they carry a gun, they carry tasers. Anytime they get into an altercation with a criminal, let's say a resisting arrest where the fists or hands are being used, that criminal could, or, or that person who they're trying to arrest could grab the gun. Their lives are in constant peril. They deal in violence. They deal with criminals. It's a scary job. It's a difficult job. It's a physical job. And they deal with all kinds of bad people, people in distress, people who are intoxicated, people who are high on drugs, people who are um, mentally ill, schizophrenic. Or they deal with the, with the biggest problems that we face out there in terms of human interaction. And they have to find ways to deal with these people. Uh, you know, uh, uh, calm the situation, arrest people often. Often they don't know if somebody's armed or not. They might face a knife or a gun or some other weapon. They don't know how strong their opponent might be. Maybe he's an expert in martial arts or boxing or whatever. I mean, it is a, partially to judge the police. One has to put oneself in their shoes and, and, and the difficulty and the, and the fear and the challenge that that job must represent. And then, on top of that, consider the fact that when you look at the police, when you look at policemen out there, many of them are overweight, older, out of shape, I don't think they can really run. They don't seem particularly strong. So they're relative to the average young criminal. They can't compete physically. And when you see these interactions, when you see these videos, it's also clear that they are, they're not well trained. They don't have the skills to fight, in a sense, to pacify an opponent. Many of their opponents are stronger, faster, more agile. And they don't have the basic skills of how to, how to deal with situations like that. Not the psychological skills of how to deal with somebody in these kind of situations psychologically. And not the physical skills of pacifying a violent opponent. And that's pretty horrific. We put them in situations that are incredibly difficult, incredibly violent. And yet, we do not require of them to be up to the challenge of those situations. Whether it's in 
the standards by which we accept people into the police force, or whether it's the training we give them. Compare the police to the military. Now, granted, the military face, if you will, better equipped opponents, uh, uh, more sophisticated weaponry. But in terms of hand-to-hand -hand combat, it's, it's much more likely the police are going to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat than any military is ever going to, any uh, military personnel is ever going to. And yet, think about the kind of training, the kind of training you get in basic training and more advanced courses that the military gets. Think of kind of just the physical effort, physical stress that soldiers are put under. Think about the amount of training they get on how to use weapons, on how to use, and if they're in special forces, if they're more likely to be in hand-to-hand -hand combat, think about all the hand-to-hand the, the, the -hand combat they learn whether it's martial arts, Kav Maga, whatever the, the technique happens to be. But they know how to pacify an enemy. They know how to kill, but also to pacify an enemy quickly and efficiently. They no need to necessarily put a knee on somebody's neck for eight minutes. Four policemen. So I don't quite understand. If you want police reform, and I sympathize with police reform. It strikes me that the number one reform should be to raise the quality of our police. To raise the quality of who becomes a cop. In terms of the physical capabilities. Require as part of the job that they stay fit. That they stay in shape. That they pass some strength training programs or some physical fitness programs. Otherwise, they're out. It's a physical job. Now, I know, they have unions. And once you have unions, you can't fire anybody, which is a big problem in the police. So do away with police unions. That would be a good reform. Make police unions illegal. It's not clear what purpose they serve. I'm not sure public employees should ever have unions. Any public employee. The, the incentive structures there are so perverse, so distorted. I don't think they should have pensions in the conventional sense. 401ks are fine, but pensions, defined benefit pensions, again, open everything up to corruption, but we'll put that aside for another show. But all governments shouldn't be supportive of these unions. And certainly it's dubious where the police should have a union. I would make all unions illegal. That is a violation of rights. People have the right to assemble. They have a right to contract. They have a right to be represented if they want. But don't give them any special favors. The government should not be providing the police with any special favors. Or unions, sorry, unions with any special favors. But there has to be some standard by which you don't qualify, you get fired. And if you get old, you get a desk job. Or you get some job that does not require the physical aspect of the job. I guess maybe detectives, some detectives, do more, more about brain, more about investigation and about the physicality. But the cop on the beat is going to have to be physical. And then you got to give them training, training in some kind of martial art so that they can easily subdue a suspect without getting into big fights and without having to have four policemen subdue one guy and without having, to ha without having the suspect be able to take your taser or take your gun. And then third, you've got to have real, in-depth, substantial, significant psychological training that allows, these, allows cops to calm the situation down to deal with suspects in ways that don't bring about massive escalation. Yeah. 
So it's, it's, um, there's a lot of work to be done in policing. There's a lot of work to be done in policing. And we've ramped up the number of police dramatically over the last 50 years. And we'll talk about that. A lot of it has to do with the war on drugs. We've given them big weapons. We've given them incredibly additional duties and responsibilities. And yet we haven't trained them. We haven't provided them with the training necessary to cope in these kind of situations, to handle the kind of weapons, to happen to handle the, the, the duties that they now have as policemen. I mean, just think of these, if these cops really could handle themselves physically. I mean, a lot of these situations would never get to where they are. And maybe people would fear a little bit more. They should fear police, but they fear a little bit more not the police, but resisting arrest. I mean, resisting arrest is, is stupid on so many levels. But, I mean, maybe people wouldn't think they could get away with it, even when drunk and full of drugs. So instead of the kind of pathetic police reforms like Trump signed and no chokeholds, no this, except in certain situations, which is meaningless, or the kind of police reforms that the House and Senate want to pass. All, you know, little things that mean nothing, that do nothing. What we need is, is significant reform. I mean, not only, I think, make the police departments liable. I don't think you should make the individual policemen liable, but police department civilly liable. And that's a good reform. Take away their immunity. But we need to rethink policing. What are they there for? And it's therefore to deal with violent criminals as, as a priority. That's the main thing I rely on police for, is to protect me from, from, from murderers, to protect me from, from thieves, to protect me from people who beat me up. That's their primary function, the protection of individual rights. And if that's the case, then we need it. Give them the tools to make that possible. And the tools is not just a gun. You see, when you don't train police on how to use their hands, when you don't train police on how to de-escalate the situation, how to calm things down, how to deal with people psychologically, then all they have is their gun. They have nothing else. They can't subdue them physically because they're too weak or too untrained or don't know what to do. They're too afraid because the, the, the bad guy could grab their gun and do something. So they instinctively go to their strength, and their strength is their gun. And if their strength is their gun, then they're going to use it. And you can't blame, it's hard to blame them for doing it because they're in a really, really scary situation. And I challenge any one of you or any one of the many demonstrators to try to put themselves in the shoes of a policeman with somebody resisting arrest in their face. Again, what they did to George Floyd is just unthinkable, right? It's clearly, and I've seen other videos, where the police are just, it's just horrific. They're, they're disregard for human life and just, and sometimes just at the slightest little uh, hint of possibly maybe there's a threat, they'll shoot. So some of it is clear-cut, horrific, disastrous. You know, these people are homicidal. But often it's ambiguous because often the threats are real. And it's a real challenge for them, particularly, again, given that they don't have the capacity, the ability, the training to deal with it. Good martial art training, good psychological training would get rid of at least half of these problems, if not more. And they deserve that training as a police. And we deserve that they get it. Because they are our servants. They are there to protect us. And I want my protectors, I want my bodyguard, I want the people who are protecting me 
to be really, really good at what they do. And if we have to pay them more, I'm willing to pay them more. I doubt we need more of them. We'll get to the war on drugs in a minute. But it's not an issue of more of them. It's the issue of better, much better. So I think we need real police reform. Police reform would have to entail real changes to who we hire as police and in the kind and intensity of training. Imagine police going through basic training. Imagine police going through real weapons training. Imagine police going through some kind of uh, martial arts training. Imagine they had a fast, a yearly physical, not the kind of joke of a yearly physical they get today, but a real yearly physical where they can show that they can handle somebody trying to resist arrest. I mean, policing would be completely different. Our respect for police would be completely different. And we'll get to a big element of that, which is victimless crimes. But, but let's just assume they're out there to protect us from violence, which is what their job is, their primary job is. Okay, we have a few questions here that relate to this, and I want to get to the war on drugs. Has unionization of police resulted in lower standards and lower quality officers? How do we deunionize a government public entity? I don't, I don't have stats. I don't have evidence. I, I don't know. I suspect the answer is yes. The union has no incentive to uh, raise standards. I mean, the only reason to raise standards would be to, 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 to be able to um, have fewer cops and therefore to, to, to raise wages. So maybe, maybe that's the, the counter. But they also have a strong incentive not to allow the firing of existing cops, not to set standard for existing cops, maybe set high standards for entering, but not existing. Right. So uh, how do we de-unionize a government public entity? I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'd have to, I don't know what the status of public unions are, but remember... Um, what Reagan did with the, um, uh, what do you call them, the uh, air traffic control, which were federal employees. I have no idea why they're federal employees. I don't know why it's not privatized, but who were federal employees. And he basically fired them all and, and rehired them without a union. So I don't know what the best way to do that is, what the best way to de-unionize the police. But I think it is essential, given how many how often uh, unions put pressure on police department not fire not fire bad cops not fire cops that have crossed the line um, it, it strikes me as these police uh, these unions are doing more harm than good for us and again the police are our servant we are the customer in a sense and if they're not living up to our expectations then change is necessary So, um, so I, I, I suspect that unionization has resulted in lower standards, particularly of existing cops and lower quality officers. I, but I don't have proof of that, and I, don't, I haven't seen the empirical evidence. Uh, let's see. Don't you agree USA is a history uh, of... Okay, don't you agree USA... Has, let, let me just finish cops. Would a cop be just becoming a reactive reporter, report taker in this environment, in the environment where we prosecuted everyone who shot somebody? At what point does it become an immoral sacrifice to chase a violent criminal, knowing it may cost you and your family dearly? Do you have a duty? I mean, this cop in Atlanta is being uh, charged with murder, so we're going to see. Um, but yes, if we set the standard so high, that a cop, any cop that shoots somebody, any cop that uses his gun, any cop that, that engages in any kind of violence against somebody who's a threat to him is then prosecuted, then we make policing impossible. And we provide an incentive to cops to stay away, to not engage, not to do their job. That is, if the penalty for doing their job is so high, then 
they might as well give parking tickets and, and stay away from the violence, right? So I, I think there's a real danger here. It, there, there is something called the Ferguson effect, and I don't know if it's real or not, but, but some conservatives have claimed that after Ferguson, uh, because of what was done to, to those policemen, even though by every account they were justified in what they did, again, if they had been better trained, maybe there would have been a better outcome. But given the circumstances, given that Michael Brown reached for a gun, uh, reached for the cop's gun, the cop was under current standards, the cop was completely justified in defending himself. Um, but the way it was dealt with, the way he was treated, the way the cops were treated, that after Ferguson cops, there was a clear... Um, reduction in the, in the willingness of cops to engage with violent criminals. I do not know, again, if that is true or not. I'm just reporting what some people have said. They call it the focus on effect. Um, but yes, you could, you could imagine that happening. It, 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 it makes sense that that would happen just based on incentives, on people's incentives. Somebody says, have you noticed George Floyd has a full head of hair on mules and the CCTV footage, but on the ground, under the cop knee, he's bald. I'm not sure... Why that matters? No, I haven't noticed any of that, and I'm not sure. Is there some conspiracy here? Is it all doctored footage? Is that the case? Really? People actually saw it with their own eyes. Conspiracy theories about everything, guys. Everything. Nothing is free from conspiracy theories. By the way, I yelled there, so I'm wondering if there was a clipping sound. So let me know if the sound is still good, and if there's no clipping. Uh, let's see, uh, what are your thoughts on mandatory use of police body cameras as help to reduce rights violations and use of excessive force? I, I like it. I like using body cams. I, I like uh, bringing things into the, the, the light. I, I think secrecy is a bad thing. I, I think just the fact that today we've got people with uh, cameras that shoot these episodes and we know that Ten years ago, that didn't exist, and who knows what was going on with police back then. That has, I, I, I think, been a good thing, not a bad thing. So I think the more visibility we have into policing, the more visibility into their actions. I think it's good for the police. I think it's good for us. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think, meaning any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brute. Using the super chat, and I noticed yesterday when I appealed for uh, support for the show, many of you stepped forward and actually uh, supported the show for the first time. So I'll do it again. Maybe we'll get some more today. Um, if you like what you're hearing, if you appreciate what I'm doing, then I appreciate your support. Uh, those of you who don't yet support the show, please take this opportunity. Go to yourronbookshow.com slash support or go to subscribestar.com, yourronbookshow. And, um, and, and make a kind of a monthly contribution uh, to, keep this, uh, to keep this going. I'm not sure when the next...